song they're singing yes he is able amen God is able God is able because he loves us right let us turn our attention to the uh, first epistle of John the fourth chapter beginning with the seventh verse it reads Loved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who has love is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, once again, we come bow before your throne. Lord, just not asking, but to thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, you brought us through another week. Yes. And it's not been because we've been so good, but it's because you love us. Lord, as much love that you have for us, and like my brother said, how can we not love you yeah. and your people? Yeah. Because there's a lot of love to go around. Because, Lord, if we love one another, we wouldn't have all this senses killing, backbiting, stealing, and trying to hurt one another. It's bad when somebody ring a doorbell by mistake and gets shot. It's bad, Lord, when you can't go to school without kids carrying guns. Lord, please, Lord, I'm praying that you would just heal the lamb. Heal the land, O oh Heavenly Father. Heal our hearts. Put love in our hearts, O oh Heavenly Father, that we can love one another like you loved us. Because, God, if you treated us the way we treat each other, we'd be in bad shape, Lord. So, Heavenly Father, I come and say a special prayer for my daughter, Nikki. O oh Heavenly Father, that you will heal her body, O oh Heavenly Father, because she is one of your children, Lord. She loves you. Bless Metropolitan, oh Heavenly Father. Put us all on the same accord. Bless the one that's going to bring your preach word. Bless the ones that are going to sing thine song. Bless the ones that hear the sound of my voice. Bless the ones over the internet and the airwaves. Lord, you know what their problems are if they have them. But Lord, we all need you because we can't do nothing without you. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you forgive me for my sins. And Lord, that you will continue to use me to do your will. I'm just one of your servants, so Heavenly Father, trying to show you how much I love you and your people. And Lord, last but least, stop by. Let your spirit, let your light shine through us that others can see it. And when they see us, they can say they have Jesus in their heart. 
Lord, I ask these blessings, all of the blessings in your son, Jesus Christ's name, I pray. I said, Amen, and thank you, God. Amen. Keep playing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. We are thankful to God on this morning. And while the music is playing and those are entering, I ask that we would join in in singing, thank you, Lord, because he's been good to us this week, right? When you look back over your life and all that God has done for you, all we can do is give God thanks. So I ask that we would join in together and sing, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. to God. This is our time to worship God in spirit and in truth. And I ask that we will stand on our feet and give God reverence on this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you.
we give God the highest praise. And we say, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Has he been good to you? If you notice, we just talking about the goodness of God, right? And so we have so many things we can be thankful
we have come into this house. We have come into this house. Gather in his name. Gather in his name. To worship him. We have come into this house. We have come into this house. And gather in his name. Gather in his name. And worship him. To worship Christ the Lord. Worship him. Christ. Our Lord. The Lord. So forget about yourself. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him. Concentrate on Him. And worship Him. And worship Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So forget about yourself. So forget about Concentrate on him. Concentrate on him. And worship him. And worship him. So forget about yourself. Forget about yourself. Concentrate on him. Concentrate on him. And worship him. to be in your house as we make a joyful noise to you, Lord. As we serve you, Lord, with gladness, Lord. We know that you are Lord. You're God. You have made us and not we ourselves. As we come into this house, you're the sheep, Lord Jesus, of the pasture. Lord Jesus, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving. We honor you, Lord. We give you the glory. We give you the praise, Lord. As we forget about ourselves, we honor you, Lord. And we give you the glory. In Christ's name we pray. We thank the Lord. As we fellowship one with another, we're grateful to honor you at this moment. We pray this in your blessed name. Amen. Your own metropolitan, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as I said. But we take a few moments and greet our neighbor in the spirit. Pass the peace of Christ. Amen.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come back together, amen, as we continue in praise and worship. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good, yes. Is God good? Our call to worship this morning is going to be coming from Psalm 113, 1 through 6. Praise the Lord in the sanctuary. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Our call to worship this morning is going to be come from Psalm 113, 1 through 6. It is on the overhead. Amen. <clears throat> Let us read that together. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forward and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the go down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and is glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth? on high, who humble himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. <clears throat> Let the words of my mouth Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my Worshipers continue to enter 
Our scripture this morning will be coming from St. Luke's Gospel, the 14th chapter, verses 12 through 14. And it reads, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou mayest make it a dinner or a supper, Call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also be at thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. I have read for you St. Luke's 14th chapter, verses 12 through 14. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and manifest his fruit in our life. Amen. Um, it is now time for prayer. Amen. How many believe in prayer? Amen. How many know prayer works? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in the sanctuary. Praise the Lord. You may call out names. We want to re want you to remember those who have lost dear ones. I want you to remember those who are sick and shut in. Remember those online. Remember those who need healing and are going through some difficulties at this time. You may call out names. You may stand where you are. Praise the Lord, 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 amen. Amen, amen. 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 
Amen. Amen. Church, let us pray. God is our refuge and our strength, the very present help in trouble. Lord, you know all about us. You know the names that were called. We pray your divine will. Surround in every way. Thank you, Lord, for your healing and for your covering. Thank you, Lord, for your comfort. Thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for looking on us. Thank you, Lord, for helping us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to say yes to your will. We realize that the time and the troubles we have will be diminished. We know that you are able, Lord Jesus, to solve all the problems, to heal all the sick. We pray divine order in holes in every way, in mind and spirit. As we pray, Lord, we know that you are able to lift us up, encourage us, Lord, and help us to realize, Lord Jesus, that it's only temporary. We call on you this morning, knowing that you're God of all gods and Lord of all lords. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you are able to bring forth in us substantial of wholeness, truth, Lord. Embody us, Lord, one by one and name by name as we call on your presence. Lord, those who are suffering, Lord Jesus, we pray that you surround them in every way. We pray, Lord Jesus, for the wars and the rumors of wars, Lord Jesus, that you know all about that situation. Let us, Lord Jesus, have peace in you, for you are able to comfort and bring forth in us all that we need. We thank you for this time right now of prayer. We pray this in your mighty name and the blessed name. We pray this in your name. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for answered prayers. Amen. Uh, we have now reached a point of service of giving. Amen. As the trustees and the ushers prepare, I will be reading for your hearing Malachi 3, 8 through 10 from the King James Version, and it reads, Will a man rob God? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. When a man wrong God, trustees and ushers come forward. <coughs>
Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we're grateful to be able to give back to you. Thank you for the divine love that blesses all that we have, all that we give, and all that we receive, continuing to build the kingdom for this. We're grateful. First Chronicles 29 and 14 says, but who am I and what is my people that we should be so willing to offer such for all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee together all things come of thee O Lord and of thine own hand we give of thee Amen. Thank you for your giving. Thank you, trustees and ushers. At this time, we'll call for Sister Gwen Bailey to come forward. Can we give her some love as she comes forward? This is a beautiful day. I'm so glad to be here uh, worshiping God with each and every one of you, giving honor to God, to our pastor, to all the um, pastors, and each and every one of you. If we have any visitors, will you please stand so we can greet you and welcome you? start with the ladies first and we're going to start in the back. Tell us your name. And Prince Campbell. Prince Campbell. Okay. Thank you. Remain stand until we, we're going to give you a greeting. Okay, thank you, thank you. We um, welcome each and every one of you. We thank you for joining us at Metropolitan. And um, visitors, stand up so I can see who I'm greeting. As I get, stand up until I get done talking. I might talk for a minute. But anyway, we just wanted to um, have welcome you, and I hope you have been enjoying the service thus far, and there's plenty more to come, um, and we hope that something is said that will make you go out and tell somebody about what you heard, and if nothing else, if something is said, that you might want to join us as we worship at Metropolitan. Pastor Sheffield, our visitors. I did have one little word for you. I just talked a lot. I did prepare just a word. This is from our Sunday school lesson. We do Sunday school every Sunday um, at 9.15, and we are going to hopefully start moving to 9 o'clock very soon. If you have not joined us in Sunday school, please come and join us and, and, and listen to everything that we're learning as we talk about God's word. Um, this was talking about uh, the centurion and compassion. The centurion learned that Jesus could really heal even from a distance. Do not miss the fact, however, that the healing miracle happened only when the centurion approached Jesus for help 
in a spirit of humility and concern for another. As we turn to God, trusting him to help us handle our problems, let us also approach him with a contrite heart and a compassionate concern for those who are struggling with their own burdens. In Jesus' name, I give you this message. Amen. Amen. Can we give her some more love? Thank you, Sister Bailey, for the wonderful words of encouragement. Um, today's announcements, please bear with me. Um, <clears throat> first, we want to acknowledge um, Mildred McCollum's granddaughter, Brianna, had a baby born yesterday, healthy, six pounds, some ounces. Mother and baby are doing great, wonderful. It's a wonderful blessing to bring life into the world, isn't it? Yes, praise the Lord. Um, attention high school and college graduates of Metropolitan Baptist Church. A scholarship ministry member will be in the center rear area of the church every Sunday for the month of April to register high school and college graduates. Registration begins and will continue through the 28th. Parents, please register your child, your, your a college student. If he or she is in high school out of town, high school seniors, if you would like to receive a book scholarship award, you must complete an application at the time of registering and meet the requirements for the requirements on the application or before, on or before the 28th. That's a couple of three more Sundays. I'm in and I'll be here telling you these announcements up until then. A ministry member will be present each Sunday to receive or register the graduate and registration day will be May 26th during worship service. Amen. I'm going to ask this individual to stand. Sister Mariah Taylor. Congratulations, Sister Mariah Taylor, for first place winner. <laughs> We're very happy, very elated. She's one of us, and she, the Missionary State Baptist State Convention of Kansas Oratorial Contest now, um, and on behalf of the National Baptist Convention, we're excited for Mariah to be the first place winner. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. How's everybody doing? A couple of pastoral announcements here for you as well. Uh, first of all, let me say, just let me announce, it's good to see all y'all smiling. It's good to come into worship, focus on God and how good he is to us when he has not been obligated to do so. Amen. We ought to be celebrating that alone. Uh, if you hear the, the keys over here uh, to my left through, your, through the speaker, I want to introduce to you all our visiting pianist, Pamela Scott. Native of KCK, 40 years of playing, amen. But thank God for her. Also a composer, amen. Amen. I, I, I can holler at you about a fight song we're trying to put together for the church later. I'll, I'll let you know. 
just making sure y'all still paying attention. So thank God for her and uh, Metropolitan. Let's make sure we welcome our guests and our visitors with love that we receive from God. Amen. Amen. You might also notice that the uh, Social Security Administration has a gate around their parking lot. And they came to let us know. Keep playing because this is the... Yeah, that's good. good. It makes me sound better. Amen. They don't, you know, if you can't get with what I have to say, at least the, work, the music behind it will be good. They let us know uh, in terms of their security for government needs, they have to have a gated area for their employees. Amen. That's good. They want to make sure that their people are protected. Uh, so I begged them uh, not to do that, and they said, you can beg the government all you want. It's, it's going to happen. So then I begged them to give us PIF cards so that we could park in their parking lot, and they said, you're not going to get that either. So I said, well, uh, we just, you know, we had to let it go. We had, it's what you all have to do. Uh, every entity has its right to do what they need to do. But they said, we need to use your parking lot for a season. And I said, well, we can talk about that. And so they are compensating us for their employees to park in our parking lot while they're doing construction. Uh, compensation means money. Amen. Amen. We ought to celebrate that. And pray as I'm praying that it rains every day from now until next year so the construction takes as long as possible. It's a good thing. Change happens and we have to get used to it. Amen. It's okay. We're going to stay together. That's what the Lord does for us. Amen. But in the midst of that also, uh, Heartland 180, if you didn't know, uh, has parenting uh, classes for uh, recommended families that are having issues with kids between 12 to 14 uh, in the Wyandotte County area. They're hosting those classes on Tuesday night. So every Tuesday night, there are families who are gathering, who are learning how to take care of that volatile age group. If you miss them between 12 and 14, it's hard to get them back in. That's happening in our, 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 our facility, amen? There are people being blessed. They're coming here. Some uh, 40 to 60 families that gather who are being taught how do you keep that 12 to 14 year age, age group on the right path, amen? And, and, and they're compensating us as well. We've got additional training that may be coming this summer. My point in that is people are looking at Metropolitan and saying how do we intersect and then overlap what they're doing there? And while we may not be as mobile yet, going from house to house or, or missions and neighborhoods, people are coming here and they're learning what they need to know to help their, their families out. And a lot of that we're being compensated for. So I'm working with the deacons and with the trustees and making sure we allocate that money towards development and things that we're doing here. We're on the move, amen? And we ought to thank God for our trustees. Let's give them a hand. And let's give a hand to our deacons as well and their leaders. They're doing a tremendous job of getting us to where we need to go. Amen. Change is difficult. Amen. It's not, it's not easy. It's not, it's not easy to be the change agent either. Amen. But if we're going to grow, we've got to make sure that we are doing things that connect with community. That's what we're called to do. A city on a hill can't hide behind walls. Amen. But we're on the right path. Amen. So keep praying uh, as we, we trust what God is doing. Amen. All right. I'll turn it over to the music ministry. How many of us love the Lord today? And because we love him, we ought to praise him, right? So the song just says, I love you, Lord, today. Why? Because you care for me in such a special way. That's why I'll praise you. I'll lift you up. I'll magnify your name. When they talk about magnify, I like that word. Because magnify says he makes it bigger. And our God is huge. He's magnificent. So I don't want to give him anything less. So today, I ask that if you love the Lord today, I'm just asking you a question. If you love the Lord today, I'm going to ask that you would just stand on your feet. And we can sing this song together before the sermon and just sing a love song to God. You know, when you fall in love with somebody, you have a special song for them, right? And you play that song over and over again because you really want them to know how much you love them. And so today, this can be our love song to God. And we just tell him how much we love him today because he cared for us. 
even though how wretched and undone I am, he still loves me. So I just want to tell him I love you today.
why my heart is filled with praise. Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? Amen. Metropolitan. What's the mission of Metropolitan Baptist Church? Body of baptized believers. Worship God. Teach the word. Win the loss. Amen. By the power of the Spirit, He enables us to do our mission. Amen. Amen. We continue on our series within the series, Follow Me, Hearts Ablaze, The Emmaus Way, Part 2. Amen. If this is new to you, go to the book of Luke, chapter 24. We'll pick up with where we left off. With verse 27. The melodious sounds of pages switching and thumb swiping is a beautiful thing. To those who are watching online, we thank God that you have joined us this morning. We pray that you will learn from God, and as we worship, you worship as well. But let me say also, we would love to see you if you're able to make it. We would love to shake your hand and give you a hug face to face. Luke chapter 24, start with verse 27. We'll pick up where we left off. Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. So they were approaching the village where they were going. He acted like he wanted to go further. Jesus is funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me read that again and make sure you caught in that we, we in the scriptures. Verse 28, so they, were so they approached the village where they were going, and he acted though he wanted to go further. Verse 29, but they urged him, stay with us because it is getting toward evening and the day is almost done. So he went in to stay with them. It was almost evening. Verse 30, when he had taken his place at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. At this point, their eyes were open and they recognized him. Then he vanished out of their sight. Ain't that Jesus? Verse 32, they said to one each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together and saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. When he broke the bread. This is God's word. Let us pray. With my feeble voice and incapacity to reach every person in their own circumstances and personalities and need to hear in a certain way, I still boldly petition you, God, but by the power of the Spirit, that the hearer will hear what thus says the Lord, God. Make the scriptures come to life for us that we may in turn may ask and be able to know clearly what does this mean for us this time tomorrow. Speak, God, that our hearts may be ablaze and that we may find ourselves grateful for what it is that you have already done and for anyone who has not recognized your son's presence in this space. Make it clear to us that you're here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we focus on following Jesus this year, we started a small series last week called Hearts Ablaze. 
and Pam Scott, visiting pianist, we thank you this morning, but last week we agreed that a heart on fire is a good thing. A heart where there is a place of singing of angels, some place for which it is itself breathlessly beautiful, that we ought to find things that are breathlessly beautiful, even in the midst of a chaotic world that we live in. Christians, if no one else, should be able to look at the most heinous of things and say there's still, still something beautiful in it, unless we just don't listen every Sunday about the cross. As heinous and, and humiliating and as that is, it ought to be something beautiful to us. If you appreciate and love your, sa your salvation, let me say that. We all agreed, as image bearers uh, uh, should agree, that a heart ablaze is the normal Christian life, not an abnormal type of way to live. If you are a Christian, your heart ought to be on fire. And we found on that real road uh, to a heart on fire for God might be that what we're looking for is right underneath our nose. But in order to find that, we've got to deal with our own issues first. Uh, we've got to deal with our despondence, our sadness, the things that make us sad and uh, make us feel dejected, make us feel lost. We've got to deal with our debating. We argue with each other and we argue with God. We're walking with Jesus and get in an argument with Jesus because they don't know who he is. And they have to deal with their disillusionment that happens. And we know that Jesus said, let me back up. Y'all remember? Back up to Genesis and let me show you how often I've been in the scriptures that you've been reading all this time, memorizing, but didn't see me in it. He reminded them that their systems of thinking and their rule keeping keep their hearts slow to believe. Instead of looking past the protocol, they were missing the very thing they needed was right there in front of them. Let me say that real quick parenthetically if you missed it. Sometimes what you are looking for is right in front of you. Y'all got it. We Y'all with me. We keep moving. So then we ask, what is it that we're missing? And, and, and at that's the point where some of y'all, usually this side of the, the sanctuary, get with me. Balcony's with me. This side, and y'all 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 gonna make me fight. So that's okay. I'm gonna be here for some years unless y'all vote me out, which will be fine. But until then, we, I'm gonna keep trying. Some of y'all groan because I said, come back next week for another heart-filled lesson from Follow Me, Hearts Ablaze. Pastor Sheffield, you gave us our despondence that we're sad. You gave us our debating spirit issues that we all have, and you reminded us that we're disillusioned. We only see what we want to see, how we want to see it. Most often, we don't see it right. That's okay. That's what we see in Scripture. We ain't no different than everybody in the Scriptures that didn't see what was right in front of them. So if you're taking notes, the number four is this. You know what? Let's just go ahead and close it. Our deacons, y'all can come up. We, we, I'm gonna give y'all. I'm not gonna give y'all a. Y'all don't need it. We've closed out. We've done enough. Now they say, give us number four. Number four. Number four is this: your hospitality. Your hospitality. Multimedia is helping us out. You'll see a picture of Lynn's and I while we were in Athens. We happened upon a restaurant that had a sign in Greek in it, and I got excited because uh, that's my favorite. I fell in love with the languages in, in seminary and went to teach at Carver for six years. I taught Greek the whole time I was there. I saw that word at the top of the, the screen there that you see on, the, on that lovely, I don't know, painting or what they had in the entry to their restaurant, Philoxenia. Say it with me, Philo. Xenia, Philoxenia. Y'all learned some Greek. That's good. It is the word that we use for hospitality. Now, it's unfortunate, though, that hospitality has evolved into something, especially post-1800s, um, a change. Something happened in that time where hospitality has become welcoming friends and guests, friends, uh, to eat dinner with you. It's become uh, inviting folks of power, political prowess, to try to gain favor with them. It has become making sure you smile and say welcome on Sunday morning when Minister Jordan shows up. 
Yeah, that, that's, that's what it's become. It is no wonder that the basis and the motive for hospitality is something very different um, than where it started. If you break that word down, you've got two words to make one word. The first part is philo, which is love. Let me say it again, philo, which is love, is where we get Philadelphia from, the city of brotherly love, and Xenia, which is the part we really miss, is stranger. The love of strangers. The love of strangers. You do the math on that. Good hospitality has nothing to do with scrubbing your baseboards well before someone comes in your house or piling all the clothes in the closet you know they won't go in. Getting that best smile and blessed and highly favored language to the people coming in the door. It has nothing really to do with that. That's not to say you shouldn't put all them clothes in the closet so nobody see all of it or scrub a baseboard every once in a while. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, if you're talking about hospitality, it is love for the stranger. Love is something very fundamentally, fundamentally different than etiquette. Strangers are simply that, someone you don't know. And more often in our culture today, it's not someone that you don't know, but someone who does things different than you. If you want a heart ablaze, if you want your hearts to be on fire for God, if you want to look with redemptive eyes at things that seem to be problems, you're going to have to replace that despondence, that de debating, and that disillusionment with and slow to believe hearts to find something better. It's going to take some hospitality from you. You're going to have to love people who don't look and act like you. If you want a heart ablaze, you're going to have to do some different things with strangers. Slide comes up, first century hospitality means love for the stranger. Christine Pohl wrote a book called Recovering Hospitality as a Christian Tradition. And in her first and second chapter, Cheryl Parente, she talks a lot about first century hospitality. I think we can depend on her. She's done a lot more research on it than we have. She concludes that fundamentally there are four things that really fit into good hospitality. Num number one, Food is almost always present in it. Now, we got that part down. We quick to eat some food. Got to have some food. What does it do? But what is the question? What The how tends to become the why. Why do we gather at a table to eat together? Because it reminds us that there's equity and dignity. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how much you've accomplished, how long you've been in the church, how long it's been since the last sin that you paid attention to. Everybody gets hungry. At the table, when we eat together, it is a reminder, I am no better than you because we both get hungry the same way. Doesn't matter how, how you live. Doesn't matter how much you got in your bank account. You're going to be hungry eventually. Number two, it requires then a light hold on possessions. If I'm going to be hospitable, I'm going to have to uh, hold on to my possessions light. I'm going to have to hold on to my possessions light. I'm going to have to hold my hand out with my possessions ungripped. I'm going to have to hold on to my possessions lightly. Now, you know, we live in America, so there's a lot of possessions. We got a lot of material possessions. I think that our issues of possessions are more philosophical possessions than our material. We'll give up some stuff because we'll go buy some more later. It's more of our philosophical possessions, my safety. My sense of safety, my responsibilities, my uh, positions, my need to speak first, my political party. We, we hold on to that. We're going to have to hold on to that lightly. We're talking about hospitality. Number three, sacred. We use this word. It's become one of our $10 uh, theological words. Hospitality flourishes and grows when a person or a hospitable church recognizes that it's sacred. And what makes something sacred? It is sacred with the presence of God. Doesn't matter how the uh, things are put in order. Doesn't matter. All that is great. You should do that. But if God is not present, it is not sacred. That's who makes it sacred. He's the one who sets. We don't set ourselves apart. He sets us apart. And number four, I thought this was really interesting. It is met by persons of a strong life of prayer and times of solitude. People say, I pray feverishly. I pray that you do. How's your hospitality? 
I talk to God all the time. I got a lot of quiet time. That's good. How, how, much, how much love for stranger do you have? It'll change your prayer life. Amen. In the first century, if you wanted to be a leader, your hospitality, that is your love for strangers, not just your exegesis of scripture, not your degree, not your length of service, was one of the major qualifications to be in leadership. If you can't love strangers, they said you've got some growth to do first. Who's ever been sick? Who's been sick? Who's been sick? Who's been sick enough you had to see a doctor or go to the place where doctors are? If you've been sick enough to have to go into a building, the name of that building was started because of people who made their hospitality into an institution. That's why it's called a hospital. It started in the household. People who said they're sick, come on. I know you're sick, and if I get sick, it's okay. We're going to try. We're going to trust God, and I'm going to heal you. I'm going to be with you to provide healing. I'm going to provide what's necessary. Come on with this hospitality. And then someone said, as a church, we can make this, we can scale this. When we start being hospitable to folk who are sick, we might as well make one building where everybody who's sick can go and we can take care of them all at the same time. Hospital. But it started in the household. Hospitality isn't about you, it's about others. It's the hospitable Christian who says, even though I don't know you, even though you're strange to me, I can admit that, you're, you're just strange. Even though you don't have, and I do. Even though you do things different, everybody does something different than Deacon Butch, everybody. The Deacon, even though you do something different, the way you act is different. The way you do things is different than me. I'm going to watch this deliberately welcome you into, watch this, my space, my home, my ministry, my car, my, to demonstrate the same welcome, watch, that I have experienced from God. Well, that sounds nice, Pastor Sheffield. That, that's great, but you know what? That's not my gift. Okay, okay. And I would say that you have the same heart issue that I have. Got an issue welcoming people. Trying to be better about that. We all got that issue. And I get it because growing is difficult. It's easy to just stay in the system and the rhythm of what we like. When you got to grow, you got to start doing things different, and it makes it difficult to embrace that. But I would challenge you to consider and, 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 and make it clear to you that Jesus is not making suggestions in Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. I think they have a slide. I'll read it for you. Look what he says. To them. This is not a suggestion. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you host a dinner or a banquet, let me translate just for a minute. It, when, when you have Sunday afternoon dinner, when you go to Buffalo Wild Wings, when you have events at the church that involve food. When you have ministry, don't just invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors so they can, they so you can be invited by them in return and get repaid. But when you host an elaborate meal, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, the outcast, the drug dealer, the addict. The overzealous one, the one who had learned, the one who ain't been to seminary, the one who wasn't in your denomination before. Then you will be blessed because they can't repay you. That's how you're blessed. They can't repay you. For you will be paid at the resurrection of the righteous. If you have a heart ablaze, your invitation list looks different. If you have a heart ablaze, your invitation list will look different. It will include the ones who look strange to you. When you sit at the dinner table, and when you sit down in leadership, when you sit down in Sunday service, you invite the ones who are unable to reciprocate because it is a litmus test for your heart. Number one, it will determine how despondent, debating, and disillusioned you are about God's presence in those moments when you see strange people who do things the way that you don't like or you don't understand. And number two, it will put rewards in heaven where Jesus told you to store them in the first place where you don't need ADT or, or, or any of those other security systems. Amen. 
charging you every month, and when you get in trouble, they don't show up in it. Stay, stay focused, Sheffield. Stay focused. You don't have to put it there. You put it in heaven where it doesn't rust. Scene continues in Luke 24. Jesus, Cleopas, and an unnamed disciple walking as they reach an impasse. Cleopas and most likely his wife, they reach their destination. Verse 28, look what it says. So they approached the village where they were going. He acted as though he wanted to go further. That's funny to me. But it put them in a situation where they got a decision to make. Brother Harold, they'd heard all the great stories that he told, beginning with the Mosaic writings all the way through the prophets, and that the Messiah was all in those stories. He's unpacking. He's giving them the grand narrative of Scripture. It was a great conversation. They exchanged cordialities. It was good. It's good to walk with Jesus, isn't it? But now they've got a decision to make. Cleopas and whoever this other disciple is, probably his wife. They at least live together. They can go back home, back to conforming and familiarity. Or they can bring Sister Cheryl Parente, this stranger, with them home. Oh, Lord. Watch this. Be careful. This is what Hebrew told us. Be careful sending strangers away. It might be your blessing. Be careful, but send them folk away. Because fundamentally, the kingdom of God is a courtesy ministry that's saying welcome. The kingdom is constantly saying welcome. Verse 29, but they urged him, no, no, you stay with us. They tried to give him a reason to stay because it's getting late. It's almost dark. And the day is almost done, so he went and stayed with him, which is what he wanted to do in the first place. And you can imagine them processing as they're headed towards the house. They probably slowed down. They were walking fast. They started slowing down. Did we clean the kitchen before we went home? Did, we, did you leave the clothes out all over the couch? You know, you know, you don't like folk to see your house like you normally live. We like the facades, right? They struggle. Uh, they walk slower. Let me see if I can try to remember. The stranger's going to be vulnerable, and we're going to be vulnerable when we welcome new people. You're both going to be vulnerable. They just think about it. Well, he's coming, so we got to feed him. That means another the plate. How, how much bologna do we have left? Everybody's got to eat. How are we going to do that? I don't remember. Did you make some stuff before we left? Did you? How are we going to deal with this? Everybody has to eat, but if we're going to all eat, that means we're going to have to share different. Nobody's dismissed from the table, but we can't eat the same if hospitality is a fundamental practice of Christianity. And they had to be praying. God, please, we, 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 he seems like a nice guy, but we're not sure. So let, make sure I don't have to get that out before he gets the trip. The prayer life changes when you deal with strangers. I don't know quite what I'm dealing with. It seems like a positive situation, but God, we need you. It changes your prayer life in that midst. Verse 30, when he had taken his place at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Verse 31, at this point, at, at this point, at this point, They've been walking with Jesus for at least seven miles. Now, now their eyes were open and they, and they recognized him. Then just as quick as they recognized him, poof, he gone. Wait a minute. <laughs> At Cleopas and the other disciples' table, where it could have been an ordinary meal of despondence, debating, and disillusionment, they chose to embrace hospitality, love for the stranger, not a suggestion for Jesus. And look at this. Then they got their blessing. And all Jesus did, look at your text, took the bread, he thanked God for it, and he broke. No script. This case, he took the bread, he gave God thanks for it, and he broke it. And they recognized who he was. It was really his supper at that point. It was their house, but it was his supper. You can walk into somebody's house and take their bread. It becomes your supper at that point. You're in control. He took the bread. He blessed it. He thanked God for it. And he gave it to them. 
and scripture is clear in the languages, their eyes were supernaturally open to recognize who he was. No scripts. It wasn't the words that he said that opened his eyes, their eyes. It was his presence. That moment happens because they did not decide that they did not have space for someone new. And just like that, he vanished out of their sight. I'd like to believe that dinner at this dinner table, Sister Berta, was never the same again. When Jesus comes and sit at the table with you, and he take your bread and break it and hand it back to you, and you see him different, I don't think they ate the same, even if it was microwave dinners from there on. I don't think it was the same kind of meal anymore. I just don't. I'd like to believe that dinner wasn't the same. I'd like to believe their house wasn't the same. And, and I might hope uh, w- w- would be that they uh, would not turn their dinner table and their house into a museum. Come see where Jesus was. Look where he came that one time. Come sit at the table. You got to pay us to sit down. Now, we're not going to feed you. You just sit and sit where Jesus once sat. This is a museum. Uh, uh, I I like to believe that there were many other strangers that they brought to the table after that. If If he comes through one stranger, what happens if we bring other strangers? Maybe we'll find that those strangers aren't so much strangers, but God in in disguise, otherwise known as angels, messengers of God. See Hebrews for that. Verse 32. Their hearts ablaze. Look what happened. Verse 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together and saying, the Lord, I should have broke this up. Ooh, this is good. I can't, we can't do it. This is good. And saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke bread. Parenthetically, side note, they're receiving hospitality in verse 34, 35. We don't have time for it. If you want your heart ablaze, You have to get rid of your despondence, your debating, and your disillusioned heart. If you want a blaze heart, if that's what you want, you got to get rid of it. But you can't just get rid of it and then leave it open. You need to replace it with something else. A heart ablaze is going to have a welcome for the stranger. You get the blessing when you welcome others to the table. And the process will show that your heart is on fire. And watch this. It was right under your nose the whole time. Pastor Sheffield, I don't feel like I have a heart ablaze. I feel, I feel despondent. I feel dejected. I feel tired. I'm worn out. I just don't have it in me. Okay, that, that may be true. That's true. That could be true. We all feel that. We all go through that. We're all experiencing that. We all go through things that are just not going to be fixed in this world. And you got to deal with that hurt. But you want a heart ablaze. The realization is if you belong to Jesus, it's right there all the time. Look at verse 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he was speaking with us on the road? Not at the table. It happened way back on the road home. If you feel despondent right now, if you're dealing with disillusionment, if you find yourself debating, you may be in the midst of that. But guess what? Seven miles ago, Jesus started walking with you then. I'm at the point of being really, really broke. But guess what? When you were just really broke, God was right there with you. I got a a death in my life and a deathful situation is feeling dead. When it started dying, I was with you. Whatever it is you're going through now, God was already there seven miles ago, walking right with you, saying, I got you. Yeah, God, I don't know what's going on. I can't see it. I don't understand. I still got you. This is going to be a bad situation. going to unfold, perhaps. But guess what? I got you. I don't know what to do. I never know what to do. I seem like I fail all the time. You fail, but I don't. I got you. And all that time, he's talking to you about what you need to know about depending on him. And he's saying, I've been with you the whole time. Your heart was ablaze way back there. You just didn't even see that. You didn't even see that your heart was ablaze. And it tells us, fundamentally, the same way he backed up to show how much he's been involved since Genesis. 
It's the same story over and over again. Get the scripture. It is the same story over and over again. It is the same story because it's the same Christ. The same thing he does for us, he's done for other people. Do you remember when Abram and Sarah had a visitor that came to their home, messed around, and three visitors came and said, we need to talk. We got some stuff to talk about. Abram, I guess he doesn't cook. I guess the brothers didn't cook back then. Nudges his wife, says, look, I need you to cook this meal. We got three visitors that are coming. And she cooks a a meal real quick and invites the stranger in to their house. They didn't recognize it at first, but they realized that it was the Lord. And guess what? They got the blessing of being the family that all the nations will be blessed because they welcomed the stranger. Lots. Genesis 21 got some messengers that stopped by and said, y'all got some trouble in this city that you live in. He welcomed them in. He didn't send them away. He welcomed them in, even though they were strangers. And because of that, he got the blessing of his life and his family being saved and spared from destruction. Less one who looked back at what they came from, the rest of them got out because they welcomed the strangers. You get blessed when you welcome the strangers. There's safety when you can welcome the strangers. The Godhead in Isaiah 6, So they were having a conversation. Now, what are we going to do with this situation that's going on? And you got Isaiah about to be shred from existence because he's standing in the sacred presence of God. And instead of being destroyed, they say, "Uh, uh, who are we going to send on our behalf? Isaiah said, welcome me to your plan of what you hope to do. Because they welcomed him into ministry. It expanded what God intended to happen. Isaiah got blessed. And watch this. You got blessed because he got to talking about an infant being born from a virgin. Rahab welcomed spies into her house. She risked it all. They got the blessing and she got a new family family lineage because she welcomed the stranger. The earth is the Lord's. The church is the Lord's. Your house is really not yours. It is the Lord's. Your new computer, Mariah, is not yours. It's the Lord's. Congratulations, but it's not yours. It's the Lord's. You and I are the stranger to God. And again and again, he keeps saying, come on, Sister Rhonda. Come on back to the University of Kansas Hospital. I need you to do some work for me today. Come on, welcome. Welcome into this work that I've called you to do. Again and again, he is welcoming us into his creation with grace. If you have hospitality issues, it's because you don't recognize who broke the bread and passed it to you. That's the issue. It's the breaking. It's not the breaking and passing. It's who broke it and passed it to you. And there is no script script for the embracing of the presence of God. There's no script for that. You just have to choose to embrace that he is omnipresent. And everywhere you go, he's there with you. It becomes sacred. When you believe that he wasn't joking, that he said, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Thief on a cross, last one. Welcome Jesus with dignity. While everyone else was, y'all know, slandering. Look at this king of the Jews and crucify him. All All the slurs and stuff they were given. There was one that woke up and said, wait a minute, something different. He in the midst of dying. Hold on a second. Something's different about this one. He saw him as a real human being, which he is, and a real king. And he told the other thief on the other side, I don't know how you have breath to say all this. It's really amazing to me. He ain't done nothing wrong, but we guilty. Leave him alone. He's done nothing wrong. You got a a felon who's looking at Jesus saying, come on, I, I welcome you. If nobody else will have you, I'll have you. You've done nothing wrong. We deserve what we're getting, but he doesn't because he's done nothing wrong. No script. And Jesus gave him the blessing this day for you. Come on, welcome. Welcome to paradise. Come on in. You didn't say all the exact words about believing in the divine trinity and all that. We don't have time for all, but you understood and recognized who I am. You saw my presence there. No scripts. Welcome by grace of what is is not deserved to you anyway. But that's what the king was about. No scripts. Welcome because you understand the presence of God. No. That makes it real. No scripts. You 
got your prayer life down. You got your go to church regularly. You should. You, you give regularly. You should. You're giving faithfully. You should. You go to all church events. You should when you can. You study the Bible. That's beautiful. You should. That Bible you read gives one lesson after another of hospitality. How's your philoxenia, your love for the stranger? If you want to grow, if you want to get rid of your despondence, who, who likes being mad? Just raise your hand. I just love being angry. Okay, but praise God. I'm excited about that. You're going to have to embrace your love for the stranger because it is the very basis of our salvation. Jesus Christ got on the cross that we were supposed to be on. And in that dying and death and burial and resurrection, he's saying, welcome. welcome. And the very degree to which you understand that you are now in a kingdom that we never d deserve to be in is the degree of welcome that you'll give to others. If you want a heart ablaze, look at your love for the stranger. God, we thank you. Our words seem strange to you. We're fallen and fallible. But thank you by the power of your spirit and your son, even at this moment, welcoming our petitions to you to make them acceptable before your father. We are grateful for what you've done. Set our heart ablaze, God. Set, help us to see that our hearts are ablaze because we belong to you. And where we don't recognize your presence, God, help us to look again and again and again until we really believe that you're omnipresent. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. The word has been preached. The church is saying welcome on behalf of our Savior. If you believe that Jesus Christ has died and rose for your sins so you have eternal life. We're welcoming you now. As our deacon stands symbolically, you may come by letter, by Christian experience, or by baptism. Won't you come? Church ought to stand. Church should be praying. Let's give God a hand praise for his word. As we get ready to depart, let me challenge you. Inevitably, you're going to cross paths with someone who either looks different than you, acts different than you, or came from somewhere different. Be careful what you do with the stranger. It may be your blessing that you're waiting on. Amen? Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. One more time, one more time, like you know it this time. Let the church say amen. Amen. Receive this blessing from the Lord. God, we need you. Inevitably, we'll forget about your presence and maybe miss out on blessings that you have for us and for others. Teach us, God, to look for you everywhere we go. And when we're doubting uncertain, help us to remember now unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly far more than we can ever hope or imagine. 
To you be the glory, God, with respect to the church, both now and forevermore. And all the saints said, Amen. Peace and love, saints. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to take me some allergy medicine.